question already. All right, so um, without further ado, maybe just let us get started. What I will do is that I will have a very quick introduction of the names of our panelists. And uh, before we go into a more in-depth sharing of uh, each of our own profile, we would like to start off by having uh, uh, Akitan uh, to give a uh, sharing on um, the metaverse as well, right? So, um, yeah. All right, good evening, everybody. Once again, this is uh, Atmos Neo in the odd space or in the metaverse better known as Dark Blue, Dark Blue XLO, right? So this, where you are, is the OSC Launchpad, Original Startup Collective Launchpad on the metaverse. It is a space that we have built on our space. The purpose is to bring together a community of uh, startups, investors, and uh, talents to come into a borderless space where we can have a virtual event together in the metaverse. I'll share a bit more later. So, um, okay, we are very pleased to have with us uh, Kai Jie from IMDA Pixel Lab. Kai Jie, uh, can wave to everybody. Kai Jie is the director for IMDA, and uh, he also incubating a lot of 5G and um, AR, VR startup at the Pixel Lab itself. We have um, and he is the chief technologist from NVIDIA, who will give you the opening speech right now. Hi, uh, hello. Um, uh, say hello. You hear me? And then we have uh, Trevini, who is the um, from the personal care digital transformation lead from Unilever. Hi, and she's on the hi, road as we know hi, it. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. And we have uh, Aaron uh, of AWST, right? And, uh, the startup that helps to enable corporates enable their FN, NFT offerings and digital wallets. Okay. So, uh, hey, today we, nice to meet everyone. Uh, like, yeah. I, <laughs> right. So it's kind of uh, first time that we are running a, a event together with uh, SG Innovate. So I'd like to thank SG Innovate for co-organizing this event together with us towards the new reality. And I also like to thank Kai Jie for sponsoring and supporting right, uh, some of the headset for some of our speakers, right, to help enable the uh, digital experience, right, immersive experience for our speaker. Right. No so worries. without further ado, um, let me welcome right, Dr. Akitan to uh, share about you know, more on the NVIDIA versus uh, technology. Okay, the stage over to you, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Um, so are we going to have the uh, slides uh, to be presented? Okay. Right. So you can um, control the slide for you and um, you can say next so sure. that we just can you to move to the next one. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'll just, what I'll do in order to coordinate, I'll just say next, the next slide. Um, so thank you very much for um, having me here. So I'm from NVIDIA, uh, based out of Singapore, covering the region. And I work with developers largely. Currently, what I'm doing is one of my uh, area of work is working with the developers in the space of uh, Omniverse. I'm going to share a little bit about what is NVIDIA Omniverse and how it's being adopted and used by many developers. Next page. Briefly, if you can see in the next page, uh, probably... Uh, um, we, we can't see it. Uh, key three challenges that we observe is, uh, you know, given COVID that hit us, we have seen how COVID has transformed our life where we can remotely work and solve uh, many uh, uh, challenging problems, right? So that has given us uh, one opportunity to create new solutions um, using the technology that's available, including um, uh, you know, in the metaverse space, so that we could actually carry on our life as what is needed. That's one area. Second area that if you look at it, there is a lot of 3D data set is being created. Just today in the afternoon, I had a call. I was working with a professor. Um, he is a, a neurology scientist. And, uh, you know, he, he does, uh, he does takes a lot of 3D images or 2D images from uh, MRI machines. 
these 3D, 2D images that are then the, being transformed into 3D space so that he visualize and understand the slices of MRI of a, of a brain. He's like trying to get at a better view of the 3D uh, digitized content of a brain, and he would like to understand how uh, the um, uh, the connectivity between cells uh, actually working. So there is a lot of data sets, 3D data set is made available that we can ingest and understand and analyze. Second challenge that we have uh, seen, how do we consume the 3D data set across many areas? Imaging is just one, one example. The next is how do we maintain a, a standard of truth? There is a lot of data sets will be available in the uh, metaverse space or in the virtual space. How do we have state of truth to be maintained for a state of uh, uh, asset that we have. These are the key challenges that we see uh, in the space of uh, metaverse or omniverse, right? Next slide. So given these are the challenges, how NVIDIA is helping today actually bring in, uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, okay. What we are trying to do is uh, we want to bring in a unified compute uh, platform using a standard USD is uh, universal in descriptor. USD is a standard that's been created by Pixar some time ago. And uh, this standard is being used uh, by Omniverse platform so that you can use as a developer, you can create your own asset, place it in Omniverse place. Your asset can be seamlessly used by different developers, uh, different uh, application de uh, uh, developers in this case, or even platform developers. Um, so this is how NVIDIA bring an open environment using USD as a standard interface so that you can create many of your assets. It could be a digital avatar or it could be components that you are trying to build for your own platform. For example, we are working with quite a number of many, uh, different companies where uh, they are building their own assets, and these assets can be put in into a virtual space. And and, and uh, these components then rendered NVIDIA GPUs. And you can have high quality, real time, large farm of uh, objects actually interact with all of us here. About having a 10,000 people in a concert today. How do we render 10,000 people? There is a real time voice is being transmitted. Uh, in space and also out space. In space is physically over here. Probably out space is uh, uh, somewhere remotely being displayed while actually collaborating of uh, between multiple omniverse. Next slide. All right. So this is the intention of NVIDIA and how we're in a standard unified platform. Right. Uh, as I shared earlier, today we already have many companies collaborating, working with NVIDIA using USD as an interface, right? It's for a digital twin, uh, it is creating a simulated environment or teaching a robot through a simulation uh, environment or actually designing the uh, uh, tree space so that they can test and validate, right? It's not only in the gaming sector, but it's being used in any uh, other sectors. Next slide, please. All right. Um, this is how we enable today. You, are, you may be using T or you may be using Unreal Engine, Maya, or any type of rendering uh, type of images or rendering type of platforms or software application. You can bring it in into a Nucleus, which is a core platform which integrates. That allows the data to be uh, assets or whatever you uh, software components they are building be rendered seamlessly in a uh, coordinated way, and after it's been rendered uh, 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 from the backend nucleus, you can display that in any device. It could be uh, handheld uh, device, could be mobile, tablets, PC, or uh, even, uh, for example, Oculus, right? So that is brought by a uh, nucleus platform as part of the whole solution stack. Next slide, please. Right. In the next slide, if you can see, this is how NVIDIA has put together open framework. So the bottom there, if you can see, it is all the um, uh, components where whether it's a rendering, whether it's an AI related, any other components, software components you want to bring it in, you can, you can use it as a, a framework for you to build 
and then the, on the top is the application that you're developing, right? So uh, application A can actually work together, application B seamlessly by using the connector connections that we, uh, each and every company is developing and publishing. Next slide, please, right? So this is actually uh, 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 made possible because of the open architecture. Now, how we are bringing in AI, is if you look at it, one example of high, or one of the papers that we published a couple of years ago. So metaverse is not only purely assets of visualization or virtual space, but AI plays a very important role. So in this case, taking an audio signal and uh, use a, a neural network to transform the audio signal to uh, a, a neural network that can represent in terms of facial expression of the person. So what that is allows, you can actually use a mobile phone, record a content, uh, audio content, and then train a neural network, which is, we call it as an audio to face neural network. This network that actually can, as you as I speak, you will have a very high fidelity with the expression, facial expression of the person as I speak. So that when you see your face, you don't see a standard a static face, right? You will see my face, my lips and my mouth, my chin, my eyebrow, all that actually changes as I speak. This is a, you know, you may call it as a digital avatar, but it's a bit more real. This is where AI comes in play, uh, one specific uh, out of many components as I shared in the previous tag, right? Okay, next. Now, uh, what I will do is next, I have a couple of uh, videos how to transform and use these uh, uh, SDKs as part of the Omnibus platform. Many SDKs which you can use it in order for you to build. This is just only one example of uh, It's open, it's free, take it, try it, and, and test it. Currently, it works for English. We are actually uh, training the model, uh, audio to face model for multiple languages uh, beyond English, right? It's going to come in in, in the near, uh, near term. So they can train for many languages. It's just an example of how Omniverse as open platforms allows you to do. This is an example of how Omniverse operates, comes with the multiple components uh, of, uh, of training the models, uh, the way that you would like to use, the way that you would like to consume for different use cases and scenario. It can be uh, just a digital board that you have. And in that digital board, you know, it's just a text, uh, text display board, right? So it could be the board advertising board have a digital avatar displayed, interconnected with many other, uh, uh, you know, components. For example, uh, in this case, the avatar, the first one showcase, avatar can build uh, together with the recommendation engine to recommend something that you want to buy. This avatar is actually talks about uh, a specific area that you can train with the NLP, natural language uh, processing capability, would be a domain specific avatar. So the avatar not only uh, is uh, real time is you know convey the the speech that I'm talking, but you can actually converse to the avatar with NLP capabilities. You can train avatar to be a singlish, for example, able to converse in a singlish language. That's how it is being built. Next slide, please. Um, how Nvidia has tested and validated? If you get over, oh, this is an example in the latest GDC speech when Jensen uh, released of the uh, omniverse example of uh, rendering video clips we took almost 18 days in order to render the images to compute so this is a huge com uh, compute intensive task the next slide if you can see shows how various gpus that you can actually use it uh, in order to display right so the currently in this here in this uh, slide what we share is one of the features of omniverse is where you can have a Collaborative engagement while you're working with uh, different partners. If you can uh, click to the video, I'm not sure how clear is the video that you can observe back here. This one and uh, you know down there in this. Uh, so in, in this video, you will see three different people are collaboratively working. By the way, this is the first time I'm actually I'm testing a, a 2D image in a 3D environment in a virtual space, right? So over here, if you can see top uh, left, uh, there is a three different video clips, three different components, actually, or uh, three different person relatively working together uh, to uh, to do one particular task. So imagine these are three different assets. 
interacting in a virtual space. Now on your right hand side in the larger screen, you can see all the objects actually displayed in a coherent manner in one particular space, right? So this allows collaborative uh, engagement. It also allows you to uh, develop your solution where multiple assets could come in, digital assets could come in, and visualize, you can interact, and you can do uh, uh, some kind of activities together. Next, I will um, go to the next slide, right? I will, we will try to skip some of the demos that I have, uh, you know, just uh, with the interest of time. Next, uh, this is where, you know, as I said, uh, is, is where uh, working using Omniverse to create a digital twin. In this case, we are working with uh, um, a BMW where they actually have different type of uh, uh, factory space that they have. They have about 1,000 of our factories worldwide to simulate and they want to understand how those objects actually interact, uh, how the specific production line to be oriented the object should be placed where the human should stand and do the work the human interacts with the actual environment so all these can be designed uh, created a digital in the uh, in the and and you know can be used for operational uh, excellence improvements right the next slide in, in the next slide if you can see uh, this is where you can uh, you can imagine how ai interface to the assets that we have so this is uh, uh, in, a, in, in a space environment it's just a background it's a backdrop but over here the person is actually remotely uh, we are capturing his post estimation for those who are in AI you just look at all the joints of the person you know, superimpose his action to these uh, assets which is the uh, astronaut as an asset and we can superimpose his, uh, his action collaboratively uh, the person is somewhere else uh, will work together with another astronaut who, who probably located in somewhere else and they actually them present themselves in this virtual space moon next slide please there is so on there is many use cases uh, or probably in the interest interest of time I'll just draw in selected use cases uh, can we just go to the next use case uh, video? go through the whole video clip we just want to skip and then go to the next one right um given there is a delay i'm going to say next next uh, fast so that we can actually uh, move on. extreme wildfires have impacted uh, millions of is, lives uh, causing of billions fire. of dollars in damage around the world uh, nvidia fire. and lockheed martin are partnering to build an advanced uh, ai and digital twin enabled uh, fire response so system to improve fire prediction and suppression it's efforts it's in Omniverse, Lockheed Fire science experts build a physically accurate digital twin of wildfire prone geography. So this is factory environment where you can create another uh, digital twin. This massive heat recovery steam generator uses hot gas exhaust to convert water in the pipes into steam for the turbines. Predicting corrosion to avoid downtime is challenging. Reduced order models aren't extremely accurate and full simulation takes expertise. In Omniverse, Erickson builds city-scale models that are physically accurate down to the materials of the buildings, vegetation, and foliage. Then, wireless network components are added, including the precise location, height, and antenna pattern of each transmitter. Erickson built a custom Omniverse extension, enabling them to integrate radio propagation data and leverage Omniverse's RTX accelerated ray tracing to quickly visualize and calculate the quality of the signal at every point in the city.
Because Omniverse materials are physically accurate, the intensity of reflections are precisely determined. And screen of the city decide where to put the next uh, uh, next uh, tower. Next uh, next slide, please. Right. Well, this is uh, I think we will skip this slide. Which is, uh, more for a digital rendering of uh, of a video. This is a three use case that I have from the local startups in Singapore who is actually developed the solution, right? This is a first example is uh, using uh, uh, financial use case. Hi, I'm Charlie Ko, your financial advisor. Welcome to the virtual investment lounge. Go ahead, have a look around. This is a safe and private space where you can view your financial portfolio. Here it is. Have a, a virtual secure space that you can go and look at your financial uh, financial information, and you can have a conversation with the. Uh, uh, the uh, you can also uh, sign digital contracts. Specific uh, financial company, and you can sign a digital contract. All good. It's an example of a use case Great. how it can solve a business problem. It was a pleasure contract, meeting you. you get that sign. See you again soon. Uh, probably you're using a blockchain, for example, to validate it. It's an interesting scenario and use case. This is Singapore. Next one is uh, uh, the next slide, right? This is um, the next slide. This is uh, another startup that we have actually uses um, avatar in terms of a medical space, right? This is it MediVR? Um, so. Hello, I'm Mandy, one of MediVR's amazing virtual patients that helps you learn and practice medical skills. Just like the real world, medical professionals can diagnose, perform tests, and treat me in any environment or medical. So in, in this case, we can skip to the next one, right? So here what it says is that MediVR actually demonstrates how a doctor, setting of their physical doctor and, uh, can train. The last one is where a lot of uh, companies are working together very hard, bring almost uh, human clock support. Experience. And well, they do so using the most universal, time tested, and in demand interface that's ever existed the human face. Sitting behind the digital human is an AI platform that determines behavior, EQ, and speech in box support. Bringing in together the NLP kit. The box support. This is an example, which we can uh, skip the slide, right? Skip the, the rest of the slides, which is, I'll make the slides available to you all. You can go through how open space and a platform, which is available to you as a developer, and uh, you can use it to develop your own. So with that, I will end my uh, sharing, and uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Edmas. Right, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, etiquette. I think, you know, there are a lot of wonderful, um, very nice uh, use cases we have here. Right, thank you so much. Uh, we just call out uh, for those of you who are upstairs on level one or any other places, maybe at the rooftop party area, uh, do make your way to the auditorium. We are starting the panel discussion now. All right, thank you again, uh, everybody, for coming to today's panel discussions and uh, on the topic of Metaverse, the new reality. This is Atmos Blue here in the Metaverse. Welcome to the OSC Launchpad. OSC stands for Original Startup Collective. It's a ground up initiative, you know, built by entrepreneurs, for entrepreneurs and run by, you know, as a distributed or decentralized autonomous organization format. Have council members that come together to help steer the directions for the community. And we are opening up for community members to join us and collectively making decisions for the launchpad itself. Right. So uh, it's our first uh, implementation of DAO as well as trying to create a borderless launchpad uh, to allow talent, startup investors, people across the world coming together in the metaverse, interact and to create value together. So we should be uh, launching our NFT membership uh, very soon. Right now we are in progressively 
progressively seeing our also members also members uh you know comes across um, from different countries with deep connections for example in singapore in malaysia in philippines in vietnam in japan and as well as uh, various other countries so we the intent here is to build a web 3.0 community we can all share our experiences and create value for everybody right so that's the osc launchpad today i'm very <laughs> pleased to have our panelists here with us to talk more about the actual implementation and potential business use cases that we might have for the metaverse, right? You know, especially this week is a blockchain week of uh, Singapore, and two weeks later, there will be a blockchain week in Korea. And uh, we talk about blockchain, we talk about Web 3.0, we, of course, we also talk about the metaverse, NFT, and so on, right? Uh, today, I believe that there's a lot of uh, interest in this area across various industry, be it startup or large organizations, thinking about how they might be able to take part in the Web 3.0 new movement. But again, today we are seeing a lot of implementation in terms of uh, the area of NFT, in terms of art space, creative space. In the gaming space but i believe there will also be a lot of uh, interest right from corporates and mncs about how they might be able to leverage the web 3.0 movement and you know how they might be able to leverage the metaverse for the next revolution and the way that they engage uh, the most so today uh do well join me in welcoming all our panelists hygiene from imda aran from AWST, Dr. Akitan from NVIDIA, and Travani from Unilever. So without further ado, I will just go around you know, uh, to let the panelists have a bit more in-depth introduction about yourself. So why don't we start with uh, Aaron? To you, Aaron. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Arun. I'm the co-founder and CEO of AWST. So we build a team structure for brands and creators, and we reduce the barriers and frictions, friction associated with Web3, and we help brands transit from Web2 to Web3. Uh, this includes no-code solutions, developer tools, and on the consumer end, easy wallets. And underpinning all this is that we actually limit the exposure of crypto um, to these users. And we enable the interaction with blockchain using fiat. So that's uh, one of our core core tech. Hey, um, let's over to Kaije. Thank you, Aaron. Hey, over to you. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Kai Chie. Uh, you can just call me KJ. So um, I head up the uh, IMDA innovation team. So in the innovation team, our mission is to drive corporate innovation. In in short, I'm actually for companies who are looking for innovation. I link them up with uh, the uh, innovative startups, especially. So I have two products. Um, one is actually the Pixel Innovation Space, Pixel Labs, which is also the uh, provider for the headsets for some of the speakers today. So we incubate uh, interesting uh, startups, especially in the AR, VR space, where there's heavy capex investments needed, as well as like 5G labs. Medi VR, which uh, Ethicon was sharing, was in actually incubated in uh, Pixel. And then the other thing that uh, I have is uh, as a product is the open innovation platform. So um, when corporates actually want to find innovation but don't quite know how, we actually hold them through a very uh, high touch end to end journey and help them crowdsource from a pool of like 11,000 solution providers. So glad to meet you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Kai Jie. In fact, OIP has been a fantastic platform. You know, in my day job uh, as the transformation office for Mandai, we are working very closely with the Open Innovation Platform to push out innovation uh, challenges and a very good uh, response. So thank you, Kai Jie, for all the support and help. Next, uh, can we have uh, Ms. Travini to share about you know, yourself? Thank you, Edmas. Uh, hi, am I clear? My voice clear to everyone. We can uh, hear you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is probably my second time being here. Uh, my name is Triveni. I'm from Unilever. 
I lead uh, the digital marketing mandate for a business group, the personal care business group. Just to set expectations, my esteemed co-speakers, uh, if you're all familiar with the, um, uh, the hype cycle, the Gartner hype cycle, technology hype cycle, I think all my esteemed speakers, co-speakers, are probably at the peak of the hype cycle. Uh, you should look at me as someone who is probably at the trough or the plateau of productivity. So my role uh, as a person in the CPG industry is to kind of look at all these wonderful, amazing technologies that are being made and see how it can be applicable uh, uh, at, a, at a mass scale. Because the one thing CPGs do really well is to scale and democratize uh, uh, innovation and technology. My role is to see how I can take these uh, peak technologies and uh, kind of make them productive uh, to the masses uh, and make them relevant to products like toothpastes and body washes and deodorants because that's, that's my business and that's what I do. Very happy to be here to meet all of you. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe again to Dr. Atikan. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll, since I've spoken, I'll make a brief introduction about me. So uh, I, I work with, tech, I'm a technologist. I, I work with developers like yourself. My interests and also my uh, chin is actually difficult problems uh, together with the developers they're actually pioneering in solving the problems using NVIDIA technology and platform. So in the case of uh, in, uh, for developers who are building up, um, you know, a, a use case area they are trying to into using Omniverse as a core platform and using a lot of our recent case. For example, uh, it could be a simulating simulation environment using Omniverse could be uh, uh, pages now I shared with you. Uh, there is uh, 10 to uh, 12 sub components that comes together with the Omniverse. I, I enjoy the problem solving together with the developers using AI, also a different kind of um, um, rendering of applications and platform together to uh, develop application in a collaborative way. Briefly, uh, what I do and what I enjoy doing. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. And of course, um, so today the topic is about metaverse, the new reality. And uh, since we are talking about, you know, Web 3.0, of course, uh, we will also be able to talk about Web 1 and Web 2.0, right? So maybe I just go around, you know, uh, what uh, your views, right? The differences between three Web two and Web one point zero. What What do you think? Because uh, it kind of like have different implement uh, interpretation by different people, and Web three point zero is still in this early stage of development. So uh, maybe Aran, what What do you think? What's the differences between Web three, two, and one? Yeah. So I think uh, this is a question that's commonly asked. Uh, between Web 1, 2, and 3. Um, obviously, the commonality is that it's all digital. It involves the internet. Um, but the common consensus is that, you know, Web 1, this is on just reading data. Um, Web 2 focuses on reading and writing. And Web 3 uh, shifts that to reading, writing, and owning. So, um, you know, we, we live in the Web 2 era. We we read data, we, we consume data on the internet, but we can also um, add to the data. For example, you know, posting on the internet, uh, uploading a photo, um, and that's kind of like you know, reading and writing. Uh, what Web3 is doing is enabling you to own digital assets as well. So you could own parts of the internet or own digital assets and provide scarcity for digital assets. So that's how I view it, basically. Right, thank you. How about Kaijie? You know, for MDA, um, the government agency that you're always, you know, pushing for new infrastructure and new technology. What is, you know, MDA's views or your views about Web three and what kind of opportunities do you think Web three bring about, especially uh, at the national level? 
Uh, thanks. So uh, I think um, Web3 is really that level of, uh, as Arun was talking about, the uh, ownership of the data, decentralization of the data. I think that is one of the most significant parts uh, as a bone of the technology itself. But I think there is a little bit of a difference between like uh, what people's definition of metaverse is in terms of whether or not it should really have uh, incorporate like, you know, Web3 because is it just uh, like immersive, whereas then there's no real uh, decentralization of the data ownership, which is perfectly possible, which is actually what today we are at like uh, an AR, VR kind of a place, right? And uh, wearing headsets, but there's no real, um, at least right now, like uh, NFTs are involved in this, right? So that could also be one way of looking at it. But I think what we see is that there's also a lot of tremendous potential even just for an AR VR kind of application especially if it becomes much more immersive powered by 5G even for Web3 itself actually there is a lot of potential in terms of uh, for instance like uh, logistics or shipping uh, imagine that actually um, your trading and shipping data is actually using a distributed <laughs> ledger and therefore then you can verify it very quickly thank you well, Trevor, you have years of experience in you know the consumer goods market in engaging uh, consumers. So, what do you think? You know, um, Web three point zero or the metaverse? How would that change the way that you engage with your consumers? So thanks, uh, thanks, Admas. Um, Obviously, it's a it's a complex uh, kind of concept, but I try to simplify it. Um, I have this uh, my own kind of uh, frame reference framework, which is EV you know Evo. You could call it Evo. Really, what uh, uh, the others have also spoken about. Uh, I think there's experience, uh, uh, value, ownership. I think these are the three things that uh, everyone has anyway talked talked about. But let me just share my perspective from a from a from a mass marketing CPG uh, uh, company, uh, from an ex when we talk about experience, um, when we want our consumers to experience our products digitally, our products or uh, the purpose that our brand stand for, in a web one environment, essentially you're going to ask them to go to uh, let's say a website, and then they're able to see uh, see our products, understand. Uh, you know, the ingredients that our products are made of, uh, and they probably won't be able to experience more than that. So the education about our product is fairly uh, kind of limited. It's in it's in 1D or 2D, actually. Um, but then when we come to the uh, Web3, uh, I'm going to, I'm using it interchangeably with the metaverse, but, and 3D as, uh, and digital twins, as uh, uh, Dr. Etikin has mentioned, um, I think what we have is this amazing opportunity to allow our consumers to experience our products and our brands like they have never done before. So, uh, I could probably show people how to, I mean, you, you may think that this is a very, very basic example, but it's important for my business. So I could probably educate um, large po populations of, let's say, Southeast Asia that I want to develop the behavior of using deodorants, I could probably uh, use the, uh, the the Web3 experience, an immersive experience, to teach uh, uh, young people how to apply a deodorant or the use cases and the situations where they may need a long-lasting uh, fragrance of deodorant. I could probably use this space um, uh, to solve a really big problem, which is oral disease uh, on my oral health brands so uh, did you know for example that it's not necessarily the kinds of toothpaste or the kinds of toothbrushes you use but the way you brush your teeth that actually keeps your oral hygiene well now imagine teaching people in this kind of environment how to brush your teeth i could really explore that experience so i think experience is one big pillar of how uh, I, I would use or our brands could use um, uh, uh, could use this technology. The others are the ones that the uh, the speakers have spoken about, which is value creation, which is essentially dollar value creation. I think in Web One, 
to and to be honest, uh, I I would say even in Web three, <laughs> value creation still will largely lie the the big guns. Uh, you know the the big guys who own uh, like with Meta going into the space, etc. Let's be kind of realistic about it. I don't think it's going to be the complete utopian world of freedom. I think uh, value creation will still settle in the in the hands of the few, and therefore ownership, which is linked to that, is uh, how many people can own the content. So, for example, from an ownership perspective, we have seen our businesses evolve. Used to be a time where only the brand used to tell the story of the brand. Now we as we have moved to a time when we cannot but not work with creators. We have to work with uh, a, a huge contingent of creators, like influencers, um, uh, to help tell the stories of our brands. So ownership of our content and storytelling is also becoming kind of dispersed. Uh, uh, amongst even our consumers, I think this is how I see, uh, you know, in terms of experience, value creation, and ownership difference or the evolution right. from Web one to Web three. Thank you so much. Yeah, very interesting. I think you know one of the key examples about having you know in the environment where you had a hands-on experience, even remotely in a virtual environment to your users, that really trans. Just the way that you interacted, interact with your consumer, right? So, in fact, uh, I read about you know Meta also trying to move from uh, content, social sharing into consumption, and also allowing more transactions and experience to take place uh, in a metaverse. And even for Microsoft, for example, out space like this is going to be merged with like Microsoft Teams and uh, meshed. <coughs> For actual office application use, right? So you know we can be sitting anywhere across the world, but we can come together in a more immersive environment in a true sense, like together in a meta space, right? Yeah. So of course, talking about uh, new changes uh, into Web 3.0, we should also be talking about the online infrastructure and technology that can power all this, you know, uh, and make this happen. Now we hear so much from uh, Dr. Atticant in terms of the, uh, the way that NVIDIA would be able to help provide uh, the technology. There's also a concern relating to data, right? We are now giving the user the power to manage their own data in a Web3 kind of a scenario, returning the power uh, decentralized uh, to the people rather than having it residing with uh, certain large companies. So maybe this question to Dr. Atikan, uh, from the technology perspective, what do you think this kind of changes affect the entire way that uh, uh, the trends itself and how users can interact with companies and what kind of technology will help enable that or become a hindrance? Sure, I think the question that you're asking is, um, and as you mentioned about the data, right, and how the company is actually going to create all these digital assets, I would call it uh, digital data, digital assets, and how the data which is created by many companies in many environments, many spaces, uh, many version of it will be uh, made available and, of course, managed in, uh, in a trustworthy manner, which is very important that you create a conducive environment. Finally, of course, uh, how all this data could be, you know, could be brought into uh, uh, in use in a many type of virtual environment and space. So the, from NVIDIA space, uh, NVIDIA's point is, you know, looking at Web 3.0, at my personal opinion, I don't even know what is three point, uh, Web 3.0 is going to look like because we're just we are still in a 2.0 leaping towards 3.0. And um, we are in the early stage of creating and shaping. Um, so time will tell how the 3.0 is going to look like. But coming back to the question, from NVIDIA perspective, uh, we've already seen the trend of bringing uh, the virtual space. You know, you can call it as uh, whatever name is given, going into large scale, right? Where people are looking at bringing in assets of 10,000 people in a stadium, having a... Uh, probably a concert, right? 
when when that happens, coming back to the data, uh, the assets being created for virtual stadium, for example, uh, uh, people who are coming to watch, uh, the content which is being uh, put up uh, in the stadium event, for example, it could be the voice of the of the singer, uh, it could be a comedy. Uh, a drama being uh, designed and developed by a specific group of people, right? How do we digitize the, the digital content has to be protected, uh, how they're being presented, how the people are going to come and watch, uh, and also how this large 10,000 people can congregate and have fun and enjoy the, um, you know, the, the, the concert, for example, in the, in the digital space, it's a digital stadium. Uh, this virtual space right. could uh, have all this data to be rendered and visualized individually. Given the context, this is the same for everybody else. So in, including we are creating uh, uh, together with a lot of CSPs um, where there, there will be uh, GPUs in a cloud so that you can have the whole rendering happens in a cloud given there is a good 5G network connectivity, the end device, wherever you are connected to the network, you can consume while the rendering takes place in the uh, CSP environment. So uh, to, in a nutshell, um, the data need to be protected. Uh, it has to be, uh, uh, I would call, uh, uh, digitized in, in, in the manner of which is, uh, it could be locked at unique level so uh, NVIDIA has all the features uh, comes together with NVIDIA hardware itself. You can actually have uh, a key uh, to protect the assets. Um, then, of course, there'll be a lot of other layers of applications are going to come. The middleware, uh, other components, uh, uh, for example, blockchain could be used as an example, right? Um, for all these assets to be protected and how these in assets going to be interact to each other and how do you keep track and make sure worthiness of this assets and the uh, reliability of the assets in the space being maintained. I think a lot of uh, space available for the developers and application middleware creators to come in and create the platform. But the most important, it has to be in an open platform. Everybody can work together to create a harmonized solution. <laughs> That's my... Uh, response to the question. Right. Thank you. Yeah, of course, you know, today there are so many uh, different implementation and versions of uh, Metaverse and even some of the NFT uh, that perhaps we purchase might not be able to use across and portable across different worlds, right? So, uh, Aaron, you are in a business of uh, creating NFTs and it seems to be pretty synonymous with the and metaverse. Can you share a little bit more, right? How does uh, NFT really ties into all these, you know, new, uh, new movement and new, you know, spaces and, and that's it. Yeah. So, um, I think this is a important. Uh, hello. I don't believe we can hear you. Aaron, I think you uh, mute yourself. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're a bit soft. Yes. You're back. We can hear you now. You're back. Can you hear me now? Okay. I was lost in the metaverse. So, um. <laughs> okay. Just want to make sure that I've got my, um, If I on okay, so uh, you can hear me okay now, right? It's loud and clear. Okay, great. So um, the question on on how NFTs um, interact with the metaverse. Um, so I think we have to be clear about how the technologies are distinguished. Um, and my view, eventually, decentralization and web three not the end, right? It's it's the means to an end. And in my view, I think. Um, the end is really a mixture of technologies, right? So NVIDIA is, you know, working on one vertical. Um, there are many blockchain companies that are, you know, working on front-end solutions, uh, infrastructure solutions, back-end solutions. Um, even this event is 
based on Web2 technology. So this is a VR event. Um, the metaverse as a concept is abstract. So, um, you know, WhatsApp could be a metaverse. We are kind of, you know, interacting um, in via the internet, right? Um, Deliveroo could be a food metaverse because we're ordering food from an app and getting it delivered to us. Um, so, so where do NFTs really come into play um, in this metaverse concept, or in, or which is typically associated with three D environments? Um, I, I would say uh, ownership is is kind of like the pinning, um, uh, you know, uh, focus. Meaning, let's say we're in this environment, um, anyone could create, or a creator or brand could create digital goods within this environment and enable ownership of this environment. So everyone is here in VR. Uh, maybe Trivani could you know, have some uh, digital goods that she wants to sell, may promote um, learning experiences. Maybe she might be selling digital cards in, in this environment, which gives you access to online tutorials. Um, to give ownership of that digital good, NFTs come into play. and. I think um, to the earlier question on how we can protect data and, and you know giving power to the user, um, you know typically you interact with a chain with a wallet and you've got seed phrases and private keys. Um, so the question is how do you then educate users on protecting that? And there's no there's typically no customer support in in Web three. So if you lose your keys, um, you know you lose your seed phrase. That's it. Um, so I think where technology is going, um, hopefully it focuses on how we can educate users on protecting their identity on the blockchain. Uh, not just identity, but protecting their assets on, on chain as well. So AWST is building infrastructure for this. We are, we're making it simple for users to interact with the chain. Uh, we believe in NFT technology um, simply because uh, we are already interacting in several digital worlds, including VR. And there will be ownership and leverage of IP to create more digital goods. You know, I'm waiting for the day Lego drops, you know, um, NF, uh, NFT Lego sets. You could build Lego sets and the NFTs and you could trade them once you get bought with them. Maybe <laughs> they're working on it already, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be really cool. So imagine if you have a black box drop, like you get a Lego set that's $1,000 um, and it's an NFT set that you can build and trade. And that becomes a digital good or maybe parents in 10 years time or maybe less will be buying digital toys for their kids and they'd be playing with these toys via a VR set and when they're bought with the toy, sell that toy. So I, I, that's how I see, you know, Web2 and Web3 interacting with each other or NFTs interacting in the VR space. Um, yeah. Um, hey, uh, um, can I, I think give, that's... Edmas, can I give Please a... go ahead. Uh, can I give a uh, very Chavini, simple please? use case? Okay. Um, yes, Travini, just go to, ahead. Sure. Just to build on Arun's point, uh, I just wanted to share again, like I said, uh, uh, where I come from is uh, way down the uh, on the pathway on the hype cycle. But uh, uh, just to build on his point, and this is nothing new, what we are doing at uh, Unilever is, uh, 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 and we know the narrative on NFTs has been changing const uh, recently, very recently. We're looking at this NFTs as a viable source of fundraising, or not just thing that we do. Therefore, we're doing something in Web3, not just to impact Web1, but to impact real life. Um, so where um, our brand's Lifeboy is partnering, has given some kind of a design inspiration to an existing NFT IP. Uh, and uh, we're going to see how that works, you know, how uh, that uh, the NFT, which is Ape Kids Club, we're partnering with them, or we're giving design, design inspiration to them, how that's going to kind of uh, work out. And the proceeds of those uh, sales eventually go to uh, 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 our NGO partners who do real work of real hygiene education in the real world. So there is There are use cases, and I'm sure fundraising through NFTs is, uh, is something that every, many people do nowadays. Uh, but this is something that we're doing, uh, and just wanted to share that as a as a live use case example of bridging Web three for not just Web one and two, actually for real life. 
very interesting. So uh, since we're talking about the real life implementation, uh, we also, you know, of course, in terms of the creating value, we'll also be thinking about what would be the kind of revenue streams or new revenue stream can be derived from uh, Web3 or Metaverse. So uh, yeah, maybe over to Travini again, what are your views in terms of the revenue stream? And then maybe Kaiji also can share with us, given your stint, uh, you know, with uh, the carousel. I can uh, I can quickly go. Uh, I think some of the examples have already been mentioned. Uh, Dr. Etikin and Arun talked about uh, digital goods, digital twins. I think that is is something that could happen. But I suspect for uh, sectors such as ours, such as the consumer package goods sector, there are certain categories for which digital goods are more uh, kind of suitable, and certain categories we shouldn't be doing that. So, for example, I think um, the audience category, which speaks to a much younger audience, is more uh, suitable for uh, uh, for creating digital uh, twins. In the UK, I believe our Axe deodorant has already created something called the Doja Can. Um, it, it is an actual innovation product. You can actually buy the real thing off the shelf while also buying something uh, in in the virtual space. I do think I was very excited to see the um, the digital twin examples uh, that Dr. Etikin shared because before we even get to a revenue model, I think this has immediate use case um, of the process work that we do. So therefore, it's probably a revenue model for our agency partners. As some of you may be aware, big companies like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, etc., do a lot of consumer testing of communications and product even before we go into the market the real thing some of the uh, uh, the 3d uh, examples the the example of the rhinoceros and the um, um, uh, the man on the moon uh, are great examples of how uh, we could do testing of television advertising or digital advertising Using at, at hopefully what could be eventually lower cost, uh, because right now we go through a very cumbersome process of, uh, you know, animating and drawing storyboards, etc., mimic uh, what the real advertising could be. But this seems to be an easier shortcut to test and simulate storytelling before we get to the real environment. So I, I see some process use cases for revenue models maybe for our partners and some eventual use cases of um, digital innovation uh, digital goods which are innovation but right now biggest the biggest use case for us is to engage with audiences uh, with the people who we sell our products to that are increasingly spending time in these kind of spaces it's essentially our immediate use case in the next uh, uh, from now to the next 12 months I just want Very to touch on the How about Hi, screen, right? Okay, Dr. Kedin, yeah. Yeah, I mean, before, uh, just a quick one. Uh, to any mention, uh, this is where we see a lot of developers coming in using our assets and uh, would say, uh, not, not to, no, I don't know whether it's the right word, but it's about personalizing it or creating it to a, a different environment. Because, uh, you know, we allow using AI, you create one, uh, one, storyboarding one space it can easily transform to another space or another verse right and then that verse is actually can communicate or, or could be presented to the verse uh, very um, immersively to what they are looking for um, so that is actually we call it in a bit more as like a digital twin but also in a simulated environment so that it can create that processes uh, the pipelines much faster much easier and then uh, you know you, you you have a great point here, which is I learned from you today. You can use it to uh, test it with your specific group of people. How do they yeah. react to that as one way to learn? Right. Um, I'll, I'll pass it to uh, Kaichi. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let me just go amplify my voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, Actually, I, I was very interested in what Trivani was talking about because that's exactly what um, 
uh, we'll be doing soon with uh, op uh, through the open innovation platform. Actually, one of the CPG companies actually came to us to ask uh, to to actually source for innovation, especially for digital twin, especially like product testing, so expensive, right? They and therefore then. Um, having digital twin to actually test product concepts or the product performance is actually very important and that's actually a thing that um companies uh, cpg companies are willing to put a lot of money behind so while that's not really you know a revenue stream per se but it's a problem that they are willing to um you know uh, invest in a lot of startups to just really solve for them i think that's one i think the second one that you've talked about was this idea of uh, greater engagement and that's also very important because it's about eyeballs right and you've seen like how um um you know uh, the selling of ads and the selling of uh um, um attention on social media is one already one of the uh, revenue streams in that sense and you can imagine that actually the selling of uh, attention on metaverse kind of platforms even proto metaverses like or uh, the likes of your fortnite and roblox is another revenue stream altogether the last one that I kind of uh, wanted to touch on a little bit more is also in terms of uh, the revenue stream from digital goods itself. And we've already seen quite a fair bit of it, right? Um, in terms of the skins that actually people will actually buy for um, in uh, Roblox, in Fortnite, and they are willing to pay a, a pretty penny for that. And the whole idea of like uh, Nike actually acquiring Artifact to be able to actually do digital fashion in terms of like uh, sneakers. That's another revenue stream that goes beyond just, you know, um, the physical item itself. It can actually transcend um, uh, uh, supply chain logistics or any kind of disruptions. And I think the best part of it, I hope, I would imagine is that the profit margin is probably 100% because there's no real cost of goods sold. Yeah, and it's kind of like, you know, quite easily to scale, right, isn't it? Yeah, so even for example, like this space here, you know, um, in, in, to rent, if we were to rent a real space for a, co a conference, I think that would cost quite a bit in terms of organizing panel discussion and a conference like that. But in the meta space, uh, we can build once and we can kind of like duplicate it and we can create multiple events, right? So um, it does allow a lot of scalability and for example, you know, be across different areas and worlds we can all come together in the space in terms of the web tree and DAO, one of my thinking is that you know um, the decentralizations and voting allows very quick inputs and remove a lot of frictions in terms of uh, the thinking for example myself i have been the startup launchpad uh, in the physical world for more of years I do find that a lot of feedback from the startup cannot be easily implemented because of the different uh, rip takes and uh, you know processes that we have to go through. After we feedback, you know, when it comes to decision making, it's too centralized decision. So uh, certain messages doesn't get across, uh, resources doesn't distributed to where it's supposed to be. A space like that with uh, a DAO implementation allows quicker. Um, Democratizations of decisions, and you know, I think that will allow us to remove frictions, inefficiency in the systems. So maybe uh, in view of time, just go around, you know, the panel here. Uh, one last question: How soon do you think uh, Web 3.0 will become mainstream? To Aaron first. Um, I mean, the honest answer is no. <laughs> I, I think hopefully. <laughs> you know, um, too far away. I think uh, a lot of the conversations or noise around Web3 has been a disservice. So um, sometimes it, it kind of creates a barrier for adoption. Uh, but hopefully there'll be more companies like AWST that tries to lower that barrier, um, educates consumers on what Web3 is. Uh, and in our personal view, it's not too far away. I mean, I think it's 18 months away maybe less and and there, there are larger companies working on this problem as well um so it could be actually sooner rather than later you know um so but my personal view is maybe mass adoption is 18 to 24 months away all right well i think that would relies pretty much on how imda is pushing for here right Katia? your views point Katia yeah, is important think, for uh... this <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, a lot of it is really uh, in terms of uh, first getting the uh, uh, co corporate, uh, the end users actually interested in this uh, uh, like information awareness building, interest building sessions like today. I think that's very important. Or, and also like really dog fooding it, right? Trying it out uh, in the first time and understanding like whether it's clunky, what the uh, experiences or possibilities are. I think that's very important. I think uh, I, I also take a very sanguine look like Ar Arun in that sense of that um, looking at it like um, that actually it could be closer than we think. Like uh, some people may say, hey, it's actually a 10 year away kind of endeavor. But uh, what I like to think about is that actually, uh, you know, five or 10 years ago, we wouldn't we, we wouldn't have imagined like jumping into somebody else's car to get from point A to point B. We wouldn't have imagined going into, you know, uh, staying in someone else's home or vacation. But technology and the mindsets have changed so much since then. I don't expect that it will change even faster because of uh, all these new technologies and the disruption that's happening. Right. Okay. How about uh, Trevini? What's your view? Well, uh, Soon I think will Web3 it's, become uh, I think we've. Uh, I, I wouldn't put a prediction. I think head fake or mainstream is, is to be seen. But I think the big thing that's uh, elephant in the room is hardware. So right now, as I've shared on, on LinkedIn, and some of you know, I'm actually right now in a car going on a road trip wearing this very clunky headset. If you, Some of you may be young enough, to, old enough to remember when computers started, they were as big as a microwave. And then they are what they are now, which is essentially the phone in your pocket. I think hardware really, really has come down to the level of something as simple as mobile to drive accessibility. Until hardware, until Web3 becomes a feature in your hardware, some separate product, uh, I don't think there's going to be mass uh, scale. I think hardware has a huge uh, game to play. Let's uh, see what happens there. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, how about so? I think that will relies on uh, companies, going, you know, uh, the hardware and uh, with better chips. <laughs> sure. Yeah, definitely. Compute is is really essential. As you can see, it takes a uh, uh, efficient and enormous compute to bring this experience of metaverse to or omniverse or whatever verse it is that we are together, right? Um, and I believe from the past history, the technology definitely will, will accelerate in the next coming years to bring the compute capability. Uh, as what uh, Trimani mentioned, I'm sure engineers, the hardware engineers will be working very hard to bring the compute, make it simple and small possible uh, so that we can consume. Bear in mind, we still live in a 2D world. I'll, we will be interacting in the next, uh, you know, you call it the Web 3.0, which is 3D. So having the 2D and 3D uh, in these is very important. Um, one second is, as I mm. shared earlier, I don't even, I don't know how the Web 3.0 is going to look like because we are in an early stage of defining. It's a journey. Uh, I agree with uh, Kai Jian. The journey will be accelerated uh, as we have experienced in you know, COVID has accelerated many things. So I'm sure the journey will be accelerated. Um, we'll reach a destination. Uh, when we reach a destination, then we will see this is what 3.0 is. My humble opinions, we are in the early okay. journey of 3.0. But the accelerated journey okay. started. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, if you hear that noise, that is somebody's playing. Um, work upstairs okay so um in view of time uh, we are overrun a little bit but i think there are two hands raised uh if we can just take two questions from why behave uh, are you still here why behave behave are you there no declare declare uh, Dila Red, Dila Red, did you raise your hand? Okay. Looks like um, it was an accidental press. Anybody has any question? You can move over to the mic and you can. Any question? Um, if not, yeah. Thank you, everyone.
for joining us here. Thank you, the panelists, for you know taking your um, precious time in joining us and sharing with our audience here. In, uh, on the views free universe, I think it has been a fantastic session. Thank you so much, and uh, really, really enjoyed this session with all of you. Feel free, uh, you know, to interact, right? yeah, you know, and network uh, in this space. For the host, uh, you can turn off your microphone when you interact with the rest of the audience, so that you know we can keep the conversation near to each other.